What's going on guys and welcome back to Top 5 Scary Videos. Every now and then a horror movie comes out that just changes the game. Either it changes the rules of the usual horror flick or it waves them right in your face whilst trying to do something new. So here to break down some of those movies, I'm Taylor McWaters and this is the Top 5 Horror Movies That Changed All The Rules. Kicking off the list at number 5, we got Bandersnatch, the Netflix TV movie. Have you ever been watching a horror movie and you get so mad at the choices made by the characters that you can't even pay attention anymore? It doesn't happen often, but when it does, oh it sucks. Especially if you went to the theaters to see it, like you got a ticket, you got $40 popcorn, you sit down, what a waste of time and money. Well, the idea that you could control your own horror movie from the comfort of your own home is means enough to put Black Mirror's Bandersnatch at the start of this list. Released in Netflix back in 2018, directed by David Slade, not David Spade, this Black Mirror special episode lets you call the shots. It even gets so specific as to what type of cereal our lead guy Stefan eats for breakfast. That was the hardest choice for me. I was like, mmm, mmm. It's a tough one. With over 250 individual segments that can be used in your personal viewing, you'll be shocked to know that this episode was filmed in only seven weeks, which is very short for a high budget Netflix film, let alone one that needs that many endings. I won't give away any of the plot details, but I went through and watched this movie, I think four or five times now since the first year it came out. And it's super trippy every single time because you get into it, right? Like it's a great cast. The acting is amazing. Will Poulter, Finn Whitehead, they draw you in with these spectacular performances. And then the screen zooms out and it's like, what do you think? Should he do it or not? And I'm just sitting there covered in Dorito dust like, uh, yeah, sure. It's a lot of fun and more importantly, it is a horror movie, so it's very creepy. I'm surprised more of these don't exist by now. I mean, I know it's a very specific way to watch a movie, but I'm here for it, especially now we're all staying at home. Let's go. If you are a fan of this interactive storytelling style, Netflix also has Puss in Boots trapped in an epic tale. I mean, it's a little different, but you bet your ass I checked it out immediately after. And before we continue, guys, if you go ahead and toss us a like, that would be great because it helps us so much here at the studio. Thank you so much. Okay, back to some spooky stuff. Number four, The Cabin in the Woods. Okay, I've talked about this movie many times on this channel. And on the outside looking in, this is your basic slasher flick with the usual stereotypes. But it has this underlying plot that's quite ambitious. Released in 2011, written by Drew Goddard and Joss Whedon, we have five friends who head to a cabin in the woods. Now, you would think you can figure out the rest of the film based on that one sentence and even the title alone. And they're of course the usual suspects. We have the stoner, the jock, the chick who makes out with mountain animal heads, the nerd, and of course, the virgin. And the cabin, well, it's exactly what you would expect in your mind when you think of it. Well, it is exactly what you would expect for a group of enthusiastic college students in a horror film. It's in the middle of nowhere. There's no cell phone reception. Oh, and it has a basement full of creepy artifacts, which is awesome. What a perfect getaway. Let's get some sick boomerangs of me opening a haunted artifact, you know? It's great, let's do it, we'll go viral. Behind the scenes we have scientists who are legit making bets on which artifact they will toy with first, awakening whichever evil creature comes along with it. So this is a world where the ancient ones are real, and more importantly they require a sacrifice. So they take a plot of a horror film and give it a purpose, which is great. So they have this cabin as a secluded little area to purposely kill the group to save the world. Okay, we're kind of on the side of both teams here. We're protagonist and antagonist. We kind of see a blurry line. We see everything we want in this movie. We see these hilarious scientists working behind the scenes so all these character tropes are met in an orderly fashion. And the movie knows what it is and it calls the shots right in your face, even telling you what's gonna happen. But it's somehow still a breath of fresh air in the horror genre. Co-writer and producer Joss Whedon even said that he wanted audience members to believe that they had sat down in the wrong movie as soon as it starts. So right off the bat, they're trying new ways to captivate the audience. So even the title of the movie, when it pops up, bam, on screen, it's a jump scare in itself. And it comes out of nowhere during a scene with scientists having a conversation underground. It's like the film knows we're watching a horror movie and it plays with the viewers in this fun way but it's somehow still a great horror film. Like I don't, it's so weird. Is it a parody, is it not? I can't really tell. Even though at times it feels like a parody, like the local man who warns the college students at the beginning of the movie not to wander any further. He has this great comedic scene about being left on speakerphone. Like it takes something great and then it pulls it back and it's like, hey, it's kind of funny. This movie still catches you off guard during the slow parts, so check it out. And number three, Saw. 
Released in 2004, starring Carrie Uwells and Leigh Whannell, a lot of W's and L's, and they actually both co-wrote it. Comes this new classic of where are we and how did we get here type movie. So we see these two characters just freaking out about what's going on, but what makes this movie stand out are these elaborate traps that our antagonist puts their victims through. So what I love about Saw is how they make the players choose their own fate. This was like a new genre that they introduced and it did really well. We get to watch these guys reflect on past life choices that they're regretting so much while they're trying to break free from this horrible death trap. Just me describing the plot sounds very twisted. Like, the, like, I don't know how people would pay to see this movie after I've said it out loud. Like, they've made a pretty genius series here. Even sometimes if the underlying plot didn't work out, you still get to watch these great performances of actors covered in blood and everything. It's still fun. They somehow made this many movies about torture, but because they wrote it in a way where the victims aren't guilty, viewers don't feel terrible when watching, you know? Like, ah, man, it's kind of hard to watch this guy burn to death. Eh, but he cuts someone off in traffic, you know, like, we got off, it's fine, it's fair. I'll watch seven of these movies now, let's do it. Yeah, there's gonna be like nine of these movies, there's another one already on the way, called Spiral. This has become one of the highest grossing horror franchises of all time. And it's amazing how Leigh Whannell and James Wan created this horror staple. It was back in the late 90s and they had this simple idea about a few guys locked in a room with not very graphic torture scenes, which is hilarious. I mean, this was a pitch, you gotta start somewhere, you know? So this 10 minute short got them the gig. And since then, they've kept trying to keep up the ante of both the torture sequences and this mysterious plot. Like for a franchise about torturing people, they kept the plot going pretty strong for a while. The John Kramer fakeouts were actually really enjoyable. Saw 2 taking place in this giant house of horrors was a great sequel. Pretty ambitious to change up the formula that fast right off the bat and still make like seven more movies after. Bravo. Minus the lady who got her hands stuck in the razor. We don't talk about her. We don't like her on this channel. She makes me angry. And number two, Scream. The slasher that reinvented slashers. In a similar way to how Cabin in the Woods took that basic tropes of the summer cabin horror, Scream released in 1996 with a classic 90s cast like Courtney Cox, David Arquette, and Nave Campbell. Scream took the rules of killing and waved it in your face as it surprised you later on in the movie. I'm talking about the rules of a slasher flick. Jamie Kennedy's character Randy lists off these rules for his friends and it's a pretty fun scene and now it's a pretty iconic scene rather. His rules go as the following. Number one, you can't have sex because sex equals death. Don't have sex in the missionary position, don't have sex standing up. Just don't do it, promise? Number two, you can never drink or do drugs. It's part of the sin factor. And of course he finishes it off with number three, never ever say, I'll be right back. And at this point in the movie, the group of friends all react like we did while we were watching it. Huh? Like they're calling the shots. This is the best part. They blatantly tell you these rules and then break them because our final girl survives and has sex. This movie is so fun at parts that sometimes I get confused what's from Scary Movie and what's from Scream because they're both fun and they both enjoy themselves. They both know what they are and they embrace it, which is great to see. Which is interesting because Scream was actually originally titled Scary Movie. Like there's production hats and everything that says like Wes Craven, Scary Movie. Wes Craven actually wasn't a fan of the name after it changed, but after it done so well, he was happy and he couldn't imagine it any different. This movie remains a classic and the sequels are amazing too. They're a lot of fun somehow. I'm actually really excited to see the cast return in a couple years for the next Scream movie. I'm there, I'm buying my ticket early. Like we've been ready. And coming in at number one, we have Final Destination. Released in 2000, directed by James Wong, starring Devin Sawa and Ali Larder, we were introduced to this new idea that death is this dark entity that somehow manipulates things to naturally happen that specifically leads to your death. And usually it's a pretty gory death. And it makes you pretty anxious for an hour and a half. No wonder there's like five of these movies. This is a fun concept as well. I'm surprised there aren't the same amount of Final Destination movies as there are in the Saw franchise. So where do you begin with this movie? Well, it's a classic. Usually in a horror, there's a threat, the antagonist. Usually it's a monster or a ghost or a dude rocking a goalie mask from the 80s. But death is the villain in this movie. You never see it, you just feel it. It's just the entity of death. And it comes in many sizes and shapes. Sometimes it's a swift breeze that locks two girls in a tanning salon, and sometimes it's a creepy song on the radio that tips off the viewer on what's gonna happen next. But in this franchise, usually the victim doesn't know about these small happenings until the last second when they're toast. So it's enjoyable. You kind of know something that 
the main character doesn't know. And that's like the first time we've really seen that dynamic in a horror movie. It's interesting, especially when there's no actual killer. Like there's no way that they're gonna know until, you know, they have like thumbtacks in their eyelids or something crazy. Like this is some time travel type horror movie. We get to see these graphic yet creative accidents in the opening of the movies where all these people just get wrecked and then bam, it goes back 10 minutes as if none of that ever happened. So our reaction as an audience member is the same as this main character. We look around like, holy shit, none of that happened yet? What is going on? So now we get to follow each of these horror movie survivors. We get to follow them home and watch death have another swing at it. It's amazing. You have to watch at least the first three. The rest are, huh, but the first three, very good. Well guys, there you have it. Which of these game changers did you enjoy the most? Were you a fan of Bandersnatch's format or would you rather just toss the remote and watch a movie? Let us know in the comments down below. I'm curious what you guys prefer. I'm Taylor McWaters and we'll see you next time. Bye.